It is Wednesday, May 4th, 2022. Welcome to an all new edition of the Carolina Weather Group. We're very happy you are here with us. We know we had thunderstorms rolling through much of the air area today, including here in Charlotte, where we had a microburst in Mooresville, a northern suburb of the city of Charlotte, brought down numerous trees, some of which fell into homes, knocking out power to at least 2,000 Duke Energy customers. Numerous reports of hail across the area, including near where I am in Matthews with one MPing report of half inch size hail. So uh, in the comments right now, if you're watching live with us on this Wednesday night on YouTube, on Facebook, let us know where you are. And if you saw any of these strong to severe thunderstorms today, another round of possible storms is in our forecast for Friday. It is National Hurricane Preparedness Month because believe it or not, the hurricane season starts in less than a month on June the 1st. But the question that has come up and is bound to come up again is whether or not the hurricane season should start earlier. What about May 1st? What about May 15th? We have seen in previous hurricane years, including just last year, that name storms can happen outside of hurricane season. And so one of the questions that you'll be hearing tonight is that question. It comes from a 2021 conversation we had with Michael Lowry right here on this show, the Carolina Weather Group. He was on our show last year discussing emergency preparedness and his role at the time as strategic planner with FEMA's 4th District, which covers North Carolina, South Carolina, and portions of the Deep South. Michael, who you may remember from his time on the Weather Channel, just announced that he will be joining the team at WPLG Local 10, Miami, Florida Television. So congratulations to Michael on his new gig. And what you'll see tonight, although it is part of our 2021 conversation with Michael, was not part of the original episode we featured last year with Michael. So this is never-before-seen footage that we thought would bring to you this week alongside National Hurricane Preparedness Week with whoever, who else but a hurricane expert. So uh, that will be coming away in just a moment, and I want to let you know that this episode was one of many available to our Patreon supporters. So if you're interested in supporting our show and unlocking early access to episodes just like this one, visit us at patreon.com slash Carolina Weather Group, where you can sign up to unlock episode extras while at the same time supporting this show. We appreciate all of our patrons so, so much. There's a link to that in the description. That's enough for me. Let's get over now to this never-before-seen conversation with Michael Lowry. We have Michael Lowry with us. He is a FEMA strategic planner for Region 4, which includes us here in the Carolinas, and a great conversation continues here with Michael. So I know that you worked on the storm surge unit when you were at uh, the National Hurricane Center. Mm -hmm. I was just curious, you know, how, how do you think we as a weather enterprise are doing at communicating storm surge threats nowadays? I mean, we have a lot of tools, a lot of information at our disposal, but how, how are we doing communicating that threat? I think, I, I mean, now you're going to, you're asking me, so I'm coming at this probably a, with a, a biased opinion, but I think we have made leaps and bounds uh, in terms of um, communicating storm surge versus when I um, uh, I walked into the hurricane center, um, you know, and, and credit to where credits due to the to the good folks there, they've put a lot of effort into um, developing uh, the products, into communicating um, uh, the new products, and um, you know, I, I I would just say um, anecdotally that. I, I really have seen um, the education. Uh, it doesn't mean that we don't still have a lot of work to do because we do, um, but I think people just better understand uh, just generally, I mean, when you say the word storm surge, um, I think, uh, you know, 10 years ago, there was probably a lot more confusion in what that means versus when you say storm surge today. And I, and I, I also like that we have, um, uh, developed, or we have gone sort of in the direction of um, developing the information that's useful to people that are on land versus, um, you know, eight or nine years ago when uh, these, the ways a lot of the times we communicate the storm surge forecasts such as mean, low, or low water, 
people don't know what that means. It doesn't, I mean, what, what sort of water might I get where I live? That's what people are, are most concerned about. Um, and we're, you know, delivering that information on a, on a regular basis. Um, so I, I think there's been a lot of progress, um, you know, and, and, and if you, if you talk to the uh, folks at NHC, I'm sure they would tell you there's still a, a long ways to go. I know that there's um, efforts to, to incorporate, um, you know, wave activity. Uh, and ultimately, I think where the enterprise is going with all of this is just people want to know, like, how much water am I going to get where I am? I don't care if it's from the ocean. I don't care if it's from um, the rain that's falling from the sky. Just tell me how much flooding I might get where I live. That's a tough question to answer, but um, you know that's that's sort of where we're headed with all of this. We we have our friend Mark Suddeth on every year to kind of recap hurricane season, and yeah. Mark goes out and just you know mounts these cameras up and um, has really, in my opinion, showed storm surge with video wise, and and yeah. I think maybe you agree with me. Maybe that's kind of helped also push people because when you hear storm surge, you may not know exactly what it is, but when you actually see the picture of it or the video, it kind of pushes that a little bit further. Yeah, I agree. And um, first of all, I, I love Mark. Uh, we worked, I worked with Mark a lot when I was with the Weather Channel and I think he does tremendous work. And what I really like about what Mark does is, um, especially with the storm surge cameras that that he that he puts out, um, is that he's putting them out in advance. He's not like standing out in the floodwaters with a camera, right? Um, but it's getting the visuals, those really impactful visuals um, that I, I, you know, we can show over and over in, in, in outreach and um, in helping people understand what the threat is, um, but doing it sort of in, in a safe way. Um, yeah, I've seen a lot of the stuff that he puts out on social media, um, during uh, and after uh, hurricane events is is just is really good instructional material. Like, you know, you, you want people, it's one of these weird things where, you know, I kind of go back and forth on, you know, um, you know storm chasers. And um, the, I think the way that um, the way that he handles it and in, in getting those pictures is um, is in, is really valuable to us in, in terms of our our outreach. Um, so yeah, no, I I completely agree with you, Scotty. And I mean, even some of the um, the new um, technology that they use, you know, at the Weather Channel, some of this um, uh, mixed reality type stuff where they show, hey, here's what it could look like um, in your area if you were to get six nine feet of water. I think that's also also helpful too. Um, uh, to help people better understand what it is. Um, Cause you know, unless you've been flooded, it's really hard to understand how scary it is. And I, and I've been in a, in a house that's flooded and it's, it's crazy how water comes into a home. I mean, it comes through the, the toilets, it comes through the walls. It's not in the, like the, a lot of the, the places you might expect it. And there's, it's no, there's nowhere to go except up, um, you know, and, yeah, flooding is not something I want any part of. <laughs> a couple of things coming out this year from the the WMO. Uh, a, uh, doing away with the Greek names. Uh, mm -hmm. This it was actually some confusion uh, that set in. I would like your opinion on that. And then another one that we're internally discussing in the weather community is poss the possibility of moving hurricane season up to maybe May 1st. Or, or you know, that's kind of yeah. a day that's being thrown around. But what, what's your thoughts on, on those two topics? So I'm really I'm, I'm actually interested to hear just the panel and your thoughts, especially on on the moving of, of hurricane season because I could be I could be convinced either either way um, and I'll I'll explain why. But uh, in terms of the Greek alphabet, I think that's a good move. Um, I, yeah, I think they probably should have had that you know um, uh, backup list um, kind of always as as, an, as a way of operating. I know that. Um, uh, uh, James Franklin at the Hurricane Center, who was in charge of the hurricane forecasters um, for for a long while um, before his retirement a few years back, he was always a big proponent for um, not having the Greek alphabet, but having that um, uh, backup list. So I, I think that's a I think that's a good thing. Um, the Greek alphabet gets a little confusing to folks, and you know what, <laughs> you know, is gamma before epsilon, and you know what have you. Um, so, so I'm good with that. And, and that's, that's actually kind of a big deal, um, you know, for, for us, for like the hurricane nerds, I don't know if, I'm not sure how much of it is for the general public. 
Uh, and in terms of um, of changing the uh, date of hurricane season, so this is actually something I, I, I I'm interested in looking in a little bit into to a little bit more. I, I'm one thing. One question that comes to mind is when you look at the the number of um, uh, not just the number of storms that form prior to June first, but um, the uh, tropical storm watches, tropical storm warnings, sort of the perceived uh, the impacts or the are the possible impacts from tropical cyclones because that's the perception, the public perception of we're getting hurricanes in May or we're getting let's say tropical storms generally. You I mean you can't get hurricanes in May, um, but we're getting tropical activity in May that is impacting us. Um, you know, so if if the if the public kind of feels like they're in hurricane season, then maybe we should have hurricane season in May. On the other hand, um, I think there is a case to be made that if you know you kind of you you start all the chatter early on and you kind of get people worked up in May and in June, um, by and large, you know the biggest, most consequential hurricanes are in August, September, and October. Um, and so you don't, I, I, I worry a little bit about the public tuning out a little too early. Um, and you really kind of want to keep them engaged, especially as you get into, because in a lot of years, you don't have um, a lot of impactful, at least activity in the early months. Um, and in the, the storms that do happen uh, tend to be the big rainmakers that you see, um, you know, the Allison's and um, and that sort of thing. Um, but I don't know. I, I mean, I think that's a great question. That's not really a question for me so much as for the so social scientists uh, in terms of how the, the public sees hurricane season. Um, what do you guys think? You know, I agree. You know, it would fall in line with the Eastern North Pacific per yeah. se, right? Because they start May yep. the 15th. Yep. So, I mean, to go in line with that, it would just make it even across the board. You know, we're already, they're already flowing out products on May the 15th. So it would just, you know, for continuity purposes, it would be good. I think May the 1st might be a stretch. We have seen subtropical systems form before that date, but you know, 2012 is a good example. We had Alberto and Beryl both yep. uh, make a rake at the coastline along the yep. Southeast coast. Um, and those are tropical storms back to back, you know, week before Memorial Day weekend, and then on Memorial Day weekend. So you're talking about like the tourist season being impacted here when they just getting started. And Beryl, um, Beryl was close to a hurricane. Yeah. There was one yeah. of the hurricanes there at the time. Um, was, yeah. You had Arthur. Well, that, that was a little bit later storm, but right. um, uh but yeah those two in 2012 the most memorable for me now yeah. I and mean, we're starting to see that more and more where it's it's very common to see a tropical cyclone or cyclogenesis for that matter along certain areas on southeast and that's already identified as a region that should be on the watch for things like that in the month of may yeah so my my inclination is to go with yes i think may 15th is a it's a very it should be should be done I should never forecast the forecasters, but <laughs> if you had asked me before the WMO met, I would have guessed that they would have shifted the hurricane season back to May 15th. Um, you know, simply you look at, like you said, hur the hurricane center, if they're doing regular tropical weather outlooks, you would think that's sort of a, um, an indicator that they were going to move in that direction. But, you know, if you look at the statement, they just, they did say specifically for 2021. So you wonder if they'll reevaluate this again next year. You, you wore many hats in the weather community, working for FEMA, uh, the National Hurricane Center, the Weather Channel, uh, Florida Emergency Management, um, all dealing with weather, Department of Defense. I want to know, um, what, has, what, have you been, what have you learned from each of those stops, and which one do you think uh, might have benefited you the most? When I was with the Florida Division of Emergency Management, um, in the 04 and 05 hurricane season. What I learned from that was just the basics of emergency management. Um, I started there actually as an undergraduate and then I continued through graduate school um, and did graduate school while, while I worked um, with, uh, with the emergency management team there. And I, I really did learn, um, you know, in terms of how an emergency operations center operates, you know, how we respond to hurricanes, all of that um, was sort of formulated uh, with, with, with um, emergency management in Florida. So I give them credit for really kind of hooking me on emergency management. Um, it's, it's really, really interesting. The, the way the state operates is, is different from the way the, the federal government operates. Um, 
but uh, you know, I, like I got 10 years of experience in, in, a, in a, four years uh, with them uh, simply because of the amount of activity that we had. Um, you know, um, in terms of um, uh, when I worked for um, Department of Defense, um, uh, it was it was interesting because I that was another place where I wore I wore multiple hats. I actually did um, atmospheric transport and dispersion modeling uh, with them uh, along with um, uh, storm surge uh, modeling. So that's kind of how I got into I had, I had a, a an oceanography background, but I really got into the storm surge stuff up there, and that um, kind of was a stepping stone, if you will, to the Hurricane Center. Um, and then NHC, um, I mean, it's, what do you say about the Hurricane Center? I mean, other, they, I think you, just working with the best um, hurricane forecasters in the world, you, you just like through osmosis, you, you learn so much. You know, and personally from the Hurricane Center, I made a lot of, uh, you know, cultivated a lot of friendships. Um, people that I'm, you know, still close with today, that um, you know, people that I, I I admire for for a number of reasons, and um, um, so it was a, it was a great experience and a great time, um, and uh, there um, really just kind of humbling to um, uh, to kind of understand you know going make going through the motions of of actually creating a forecast and um, and putting out a forecast. Um, it's a, it's a sort of a sobering thing, right? Especially for you know a big hurricane event, um, and and seeing how they operate. I mean, there's such a steady hand at the Hurricane Center, and that's one thing I'll always appreciate about what they do. Um, you know, you don't you don't see a, a big swing of emotions, and they come in and they just do their job and and um, and do it exceptionally well. The Weather Channel, um, you know, if there's one place I I think where I, I I probably learned the most, say learned the most was, was probably the weather channel. Um, and the reason for that, it's like, you're, you're exposed to so much. Um, uh, one of my colleagues would say that every day is like um, uh, taking a field trip and, and it is um, in what you do. And it's, it's, it, you know, although I'm, I'm primarily covering hurricanes, it's so it can be so vastly different when you walk in the door. You, you know, you really have no idea <laughs> what you're walking into. Um, and as somebody, I, I I tend to work best under pressure, so that's something I actually kind of miss about television. Is I like the pressure cooker, although I work you know in emergency management, which isn't exactly a walk in the park. Um, but uh, I I think working with um, people that are the, I think the best weather broadcasters, um, you know, that, that we have, um, Jim Cantori's of the world. Um, you know, I, I didn't appreciate how good the, you know, Brian Norcross, how good these people are until I work with them. Like they are exceptionally good at what they do. It's really, they've been doing it for 20 or 30 years. Um, and they, they taught me a lot and, you know, it's you kind of form your own personality, you know, in, in television when, when you when you do it. Um, so you know you're not. It's, but there's little pieces of everybody that I work with that I that I took from um, at the Weather Channel, and um, you know, I have nothing but great things to say about um, my colleagues there, and um, it uh, was it was a lot of fun, and so uh, really enjoyed that. Um, you know, and then um, with um, NCAR and, and, um, and, and now FEMA, um, just really getting into what the federal government's role is in disaster operations and truly understanding how that whole machine operates has been, um, been really instructive. So that is a long answer to a short question, <laughs> uh, but a little, little walk down memory lane for me. How do you disconnect after one of those long weather channel days or a long day at FEMA? And how do you get away from the weather? I'm married to Kate Parker, who is a meteorologist. Um, and it's, <laughs> I, I'm especially bad at disconnecting. Okay. So I kind of rely on her to at night when I'm in bed on my you know phone doing this. Oh my God, did you see this? You know, on Twitter, doom scrolling <laughs> for her to like, just take the phone away from me. <laughs> enough, <laughs> enough. Um, I, I actually have to very intentionally um, disconnect because, especially for hurricanes, it is, it is so hard for me 
almost, I would say impossible for me. I feel like it's just part of who I am to disconnect when there's a big hurricane event. I'm sure you all can relate. Um, so as much as I can, um, you know, I, I try, I, I like to read a lot. Um, so I, I would say part of my disconnecting is um, picking up a book that has nothing to do with weather and, and reading. Um, and uh, that's, I always end my day with uh, probably an hour of just reading and uh, completely not re weather related. Um, and uh, you know, that and getting out, I, I, I do like to exercise and just get out and about, <laughs> but uh, it's hard, admittedly it's hard. Do you have a book suggestion from all these non-weather related books? I'm a, I'm a non-fiction um, person. So I don't, um, I tend to not read um, uh, fiction, but like I was saying earlier, I, I do, I like to read a lot of the uh, behavioral psychology books. One book I would strongly recommend that is not weather related, but I would highly recommend it for all meteorologists um, is a book by Danny Kahneman called Thinking Fast and Slow. Um, it, it's just, there are so many applications to weather in that book. It's it's incredible, um, and I think there's a there's so much that all meteorologists can learn from that book. But you know, I I got a laundry list of things <laughs> in terms of, of books. I'm, I like to read about history and uh, you know a, a lot of history books. But uh, the social psychology or the, the behavioral psychology is really interesting too. So do you ever get burned out, and how do you battle that? You know, I I. I I like to travel. So I think traveling is a way to, you know, if I can take a vacation to, to take a vacation um, is, is my way of, of um, helping to, to reset. Um, this year was, was, was tough because it was so busy. Uh, my wife and I just had our first uh, a child. So we have a, a newborn that we were taking care of in the midst of hurricane season and all that craziness. Um, but I, you know, I, I lean on my spouse a lot and i I married just like the best person. And so um, we have a lot of fun together. And um, I, you know, I, I think we keep each other, we balance each other out really well. One of the great things about being married to a, another meteorologist is when you come home, you don't really have to explain everything to them as they kind of get it. You know, you can just say, oh, I got it. I got it. I've been there. Um, and that's, I actually think that's really helpful. Um, I never thought I'd marry a meteorologist, but there are a lot of <laughs> there are a lot of benefits. You are over Region Four of FEMA, which includes the Carolinas. So, yep. uh, do you have any favorite Carolina spots that you like to visit? I actually spent about three months in uh, Raleigh uh, after um, Hurricane Florence at the Joint Field Office there, but it was wasn't especially <laughs> nice. Um, no, I love um, uh, you know. I spent I've spent more time probably in South Carolina because I'm a, I'm kind of a coastal guy than I have at the Outer Banks, but I love um, the coast along the Carolinas. Um, uh, you know the um, gosh, you know Charleston and Kiowa, and um, it's it's really hard to say a favorite spot. I mean, I, I don't know. I, I like Charleston a lot. Um, it's a um, it's I think one of the most beautiful cities in the South, if not the most beautiful city in the South. Um, so maybe Charleston, I don't know, but I, but I love the coast. I love the marsh along the coast um, of the Carolinas. Um, Tybee is awesome. Um, so um, yeah, if you stick me on a beach anywhere in the Carolinas, I'm, I'm real happy. Well, Michael, it's been fun having you. Um, if our followers want to keep up with all your doings, how can they do that on uh, Twitter? Yeah, uh, you can follow me on Twitter. That's um, you know, there's so many different social uh, media platforms. I'm, uh, I'm primarily on Twitter. So at Michael R. Lowry, L-O-W-R-Y, you can, you can find me there. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I typically tweet a lot during hurricane season. <laughs> Not as much this year because I was, uh, I have a newborn, so it's a little more. Uh, yeah, yeah, that 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 takes your takes your time. Well, Michael, uh, is a great follow on Twitter, so we highly recommend you guys go follow Michael. And Michael, thank you for your time tonight. Thank you guys for watching Carolina Weather Group. We hope you have a great evening.